I've got a lot I want to talk to you about today. We have uh, laws of physics, laws of computing. We have special guests. We have artificial intelligence. And so I've got a lot of stuff to cover, so let's get started. There are two dynamics that are happening in our industry at the same time. I'm going to talk about both of them. This is the first one. For the last 30 years, for the last 30 years, we have benefited from one of the most powerful technological revolutions that anybody's ever seen. The combination of two effects created what is known as Moore's Law. One, architectural innovation that makes microprocessors better and better, more and more performant through architectural techniques. The goal is to find instruction level parallelism. And it's magic. Just think about what they're trying to do. Basically, a program is a sequential list of instructions and it's performed one at a time. But somehow computer scientists have figured out ways to do them in parallel. Well, one of the ways that you do it is pipelining, to start the next instruction, to start the next step before the first step was complete. Make the instructions wider. Do all kinds of amazing things so that you could speculatively execute something in the event that maybe you didn't have to change course. All kinds of amazing technology was created. Caches got lot, lots bigger. And then, of course, software techniques on top of it, optimizing compilers, made it possible for us to advance microprocessor architecture performance year in and year out. And we deployed all those transistors to good use. Now, the transistors that we added, more and more and more transistors, wouldn't have been possible to use if it wasn't because of a second law, the law of Dinar scaling. Denard scaling basically says that we can put more and more transistors into, the con into a constant area and run them faster and faster so long as we continue to reduce its voltage, so long as we continue to make the transistor smaller, reducing its capacitance. And by doing so, the combination of these two factors, more and more transistors, running them faster and faster at a lower and lower voltage, allowed us to continue to advance performance within some constant energy envelope. In the course of the last 30 years, we've improved processor, microprocessor performance by nearly a million times. By nearly a million times. Nothing in society has improved by a million times. And everything in society has been made possible because of this fundamental advance. Then in the last several years, it started to slow. Our abilities to harvest parallelism out of instructions, sequential instructions, started to diminish. And the number of transistors that we had to add in order to squeeze out that little tiny bit of extra performance was simply too costly. On the other hand, we were reducing voltage, shrinking transistors, and we're now up against the laws of semiconductor physics. There's only so far that we can push before the NARD scaling started to fail on us. We now have found ourselves at the end of two, end of two roads. And it's it been incredibly well documented. We started talking about it, in fact, for many of you who've been coming to GTC all these years, I think I spoke about it at the first GTC. Uh, I speak about it at every GTC. And it's the reason, it's the reason of our existence. Recognizing that we need to find a path forward life after Moore's Law. John Hennessy recently talked about it. He called it the end of the road for general purpose processors and the future of computing. Mark Horowitz, also a professor at Stanford, spent enormous amounts of time with his colleague, basically plotted out every single major event and processor product and node in the last 30 to 40 years. And the results are actually quite amazing. The blue line basically shows the Denard scaling compounded with the lack of productive architectural innovations has led to the plateauing of processor performance. What used to grow at 50% per year, 50% per year compounded improvement is now improving at 10% per year. Yet, we can manufacture the transistors. The transistors are abundant. And in fact, if you look at it, look at that white line, that shows you how much transistors we have. And that was the ultimate observation the ultimate observation of the beginning of our company. 
that observation was the reason why accelerated computing works. And it is the reason why we introduced the concept of GPU computing. GPU computing does several things. The first thing it does is recognizing the microprocessor is incredibly good at sequential instructions. It's incredibly good at single-threaded operation. That the craftsmanship and the innovation and all the engineering has gone into it over the course of the last 30, 40 years wasn't going to be replaced. And we respect the other law of computing, Amdahl's law, that if we were to accelerate the things that we could do, the part that we can't accelerate eventually becomes the problem. And so we have to make sure, we have to make sure that we honor that law as we change the architecture of computing. We did several things. The first thing that we did was we realized there's some workload inside some very important applications, some very important applications. Frankly, the important, these applications are the ones that the reasons why you are here. They're, they're, they're the algorithms of artists, of scientists, of engineers, of the explorers, the discoverers, the inventors, the, the, the da Vinci's of our time, the Einstein's of our time. Their software includes some parallel computing aspects, some parallel processing aspects, that if we could figure out a way to offload of the microprocessor that was good at sequential processing, we could provide incredible speed up. So the first thing is to create a specialized domain-specific accelerator that is a companion to the CPU, accelerated computing. The second thing we did was create an architecture that had a platform that we were willing to dedicate ourselves to everything we did for the rest of our lives. We created an architecture we call CUDA, and it's named after an architecture that we created in the very beginning of our company 25 years ago called UDA, Universal Driver Architecture. That architecture was extended for computing, unified driver architecture, excuse me. That architecture was extended for computing starting 10 years ago. We call it CUDA. This architecture is our computing architecture. And a computing architecture that you dedicate your lives to and you continue to promote, that you continue to sustain, you continue to improve, and it continues to add value, eventually, eventually, other people can benefit from it. It has to be special. It has to do something that general purpose computing, that commodity computing, or available otherwise generally available computing cannot do. It has to be special. It has to be something you dedicate yourself into. It has to be something that is available everywhere. It can't just be available on a PC, it has to be available on a laptop, it has to be available in the cloud, it has to be available in embedded devices. It has to be available everywhere. It has to be thought about from top to bottom in the sense that you have to have tools, you have to have middleware, because computer architects and computer scientists needs all of that to be productive. What's really special about GPU accelerated computing was that it took enormous amounts of effort to port, to refactor, for all of you, the applications you've developed on top of microprocessors onto this new computing platform. It took time. And it took specialized skills. And so we dedicated ourselves to having a team of computational mathematicians that can think across the entire stack so we work with you, work with the application makers, the algorithm developers, to find that match between the work that you want to do and the architecture we created. We worked at the architecture level, at the system level, at the system software level, at the algorithm level, and then we worked at the application level. The reason for that is because if you want to overcome the limitations of Denard scaling, you're going to have to do something pretty clever, and you have to think across every single possible layer of computing to find efficiencies, to get rid of waste, to do special and smart things. This way of doing computing, top to bottom, then bottom to top, top to bottom, then bottom to top, dedicated to one single architecture over the course of the last 10 years, the results have been phenomenal. If you look at the green line, that's basically the line that NVIDIA is tracking. Some people have described our progress as Moore's Law squared. 
And the reason for that is because, first of all, you get a big speed up. You get a big speed up over the natural microprocessor performance. Secondarily, it appears to be moving faster than the rate of increase of transistors. And I think there's some logic to that. And the reason for that is ex exactly as I described, is because we thought across the entire stack. Well, uh, for many of you who have been coming here for close to 10 years, I want to tell you how much I appreciate all of your support. We come here, we come here, because the work that we do is impossible otherwise. The work that we do is impossible otherwise. The work that we do in creating virtual reality is impossible otherwise. The work that we do in computer graphics, the work that you do in fluid dynamics is impossible otherwise. In molecular dynamics, it's impossible otherwise. There are several regions, several domains that we have found accelerated computing to be incredibly effective. Of course, graphics, physics, quantum mechanics, and a new field called deep learning. GTC has been growing so fast. It has been growing incredibly fast since our very beginning. We now have increased by a factor of three in five years, the number of attendees. Now, the only reason why it hasn't grown, grown faster is because of the fact that computing is all over the world. Since last year, starting last year, we've taken GTC on the road. Last year alone, last year alone, over 20,000 people came to GTCs around the world. And this year, we're gonna take this show on the road again so that we can make this computing platform available for developers, scientists, and researchers for your groundbreaking work all over the world. The number of GPU developers has increased by a factor of 10 in five years. It's actually amazing, 500,000 developers. It's taught all over the world. Textbooks are written all over the world. When you look in LinkedIn, you see CUDA all over the place. It's just fantastic. The number of people who, use G, who now consider GPGPU or programming GPUs or programming CUDA, one of their specialties is really fantastic to see. And then over a million CUDA downloads. The CUDA driver, the CUDA software SDK has been downloaded over a million times at GTC this year. Every one of the top 15 technology companies in the world are here. 100% of the world's top 15 technology companies are here. 10 out of the world's top 10 car companies are here. Pfizer, Merck, and Roche, GSK, Amgen, Lilly are here. Researchers from the world's top 100 national laboratories are here. There are 80 AI startups here, 25 VR startups, all kinds of robotic startups and ideas. GTC is where, if you will, the future is invented. GTC is where we create what other people would think of as science fiction.